Good evening and welcome to the March edition of the League of Women Voters Presents. My name is Randy Picht and I'm the Executive Director of the Donald W. Reynolds Journalism Institute at the University of Missouri and I'll be the moderator tonight. Uh, and our topic is one that's actually been uh, getting more and more attention uh, lately from various places. It's income inequality. Um, and we're uh, going to have a very interesting conversation about that with our panelists, who I'll introduce in a minute. But first, let me set the stage uh, a little bit. Um, this is a, a quote from the uh, executive director of Oxfam International, uh, whose name is Winnie Bayanyima. And uh, she said, in the United States, a child born into a poor family will become a poor adult. The American dream is just that. It is not true because of the level of extreme inequality. Uh, she said that at an interesting place. It was the Davos Economic Forum where uh, 80 billionaires were in the audience, including some of the most powerful uh, CEOs and uh, monetary heads in the country, and the forum is is designed to figure out what, what to do about uh, the, the world's economies and, and make sure everything is, is going in, in the right order. Um, the, the other factoid I'll throw out here is um, the fact that the amount of wealth and, and incomes being generated is increasingly being consolidated at the very tippy tippy top of the world. So. Um, this is from an economic analysis done at the University of California, Berkeley. The one hundredth of one percent of, the, of, of people in the world, the average household income for, for that one hundredth of one percent is $23.8 million. If, if you go down to the next level, the top one percent, it's $2.8 million. The top 10% is $161,000. And then everybody else, the bottom 90% is $29,840. So that is a great definition of inequality, I think. And um, there are lots of different uh, conversations about what we should do about it. Uh, tonight, we're going to focus on maybe how we got here, and some of the things that uh, we could start to raise awareness and, and create some more uh, attention and, and interest for this. So let me turn to our panel now, and um, let me let them introduce uh, themselves first of all. So we'll start here. Hi, I'm Amanda Becker. I am a senior uh, studying journalism at Mizzou, and I'm from New Jersey originally and I looked into this topic for my senior capstone project, a little bit about how to really raise awareness about the topic, especially in Columbia. Okay. I'm Candy Iverson. I'm a clinical instructor at the School of Social Work at the University of Missouri, and I've been looking at this for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, so Candy, why don't you tell us uh, maybe how we got here. <laughs> yeah. yeah well, um, we only have 30 minutes. I, so. <laughs> I know. I have to be very brief. Um, I, think, I think the things that are important to know is that um, income inequality is rising worldwide. Um, it is rising here, though, faster than in other countries. Um, and when you look at the world map, um, the only countries that are more unequal than us are basically in Africa. Um, so... We, we are in an odd position at the moment. Um, and when I look back at history, because I, I do like to do that, um, <laughs> drives my students insane, but <laughs> there it is. Um, you look at the income distribution now in terms of what you mentioned with who, you know, how much the one, top 1% 1 has and how much everybody else has. That chart looks almost identical to the way it looked in the time period from 1923 to 1929. Um, and we know what happened after that, mm -hmm. right? We had a huge depression. Um, and so we corrected for that. Um, if you look at the intervening years, 
23 to 29, and now you see that we equalized that quite a bit. Um, and we did it all with policy that we have, once we implemented that policy and we were booming through the 50s and 60s, we started chipping away at it and taking those policy pieces away. So we have come back to a place that really wasn't a very good place to be. <laughs> I hope we learned something from that. Well, and, and as you point out, it's, it's the, the U.S. is it's rising faster, but this is, this is a problem for the whole world, I think. The, the, yes. We need perhaps some kind of uh, global solution, right? Yes, uh, yes or at least, ultimately. Uh, you're right. So. Okay, so, uh, so Amanda, uh, yes. you worked on this as a capstone project, so maybe you could just tell us a little bit about what the purpose of the project was. Uh, well, let's start with that. Yeah, definitely. So the purpose of the project was really to be aimed at journalists at smaller community newspapers to kind of talk about how to find people in their community and find an interesting way to bring up this problem of income inequality. So how we did that is we first defined it for ourselves and figured out really what this pro problem meant. And then from there, just looked at some of the resources we had in town, you know, how we could put this in different contexts of maybe sports or community outreach programs, what programs the community has already in set and things like that to make it accessible for journalists to find these stories to bring to light. So getting the news organizations to figure out how to do this, because it is sort of a, um, it, it's a hard to, def it's not a hard to define problem, but it's hard to explain and find the ways to make it meaningful, right? Mm -hmm. So are there a couple examples that you could, that maybe you guys came up with? Yeah, we came up with a few ideas. One of them was to maybe once a week, if you have a journalist who maybe has a slower news day, just send them out into the community with no intention of finding stories, but just to talk to people. And we as a class did that, and we came back, and we had all met so many interesting people who had a lot of things to say and had some great ideas for where to look for stories. And then another idea was having a person on each beat. So say you're on the sports beat, and maybe making their focus somehow encompassing income inequality, and maybe look at the prices of sports in your area and see what the community is doing about that and what opportunities some of these kids are having that you may not even realize they're missing out on or not. So just some simple ways to really make it like bite-sized nuggets for the community to understand. Yeah, and I think, uh, you know, if news organizations can do those bite-sized nuggets, it'll, it'll be helpful because then maybe we'll get this into the conversation, right? That's the hope. We hope that it maybe becomes a little bit more of a conversation and people start talking about it with each other and then can reach out to their community officials and really all work together to alleviate the problem right. or at least help it. So, so Candy, it, it, what, it, what are some of the things that we could maybe do? Now, you said you've been at this a long time. I think, <laughs> you know, right. uh, uh, what, what are some of the things that we can do that can make people aware of how either they can play a role in this or uh, just understand the severity of it? Um, yeah, I, I, think, I think most people don't understand the severity of it and what it means. Um, and and I, I love the idea of bringing it down to a personal level that, that people can connect with. I think that's, that's a great idea. But you know, in, a, in a bigger framework, um, the World Bank and the CIA look at income inequality because the more unequal it gets, the more unstable communities and countries become, right? Mm -hmm. Both politically and economically. So I think that um, we see we see some evidence of um, the kind of loss of social cohesion that you would expect in our communities. Not so much here as we do in others, but I think if we look at what happened in Ferguson, you can see that part of that has to do with that kind of loss of social cohesion when people feel like no matter what they do, they can't get ahead. Mm -hmm. um, and I think part of, the, um, part of the discussion that we have to have is about this notion that um, people are poor because they're lazy, um, because that's the excuse that people always like to use for income inequality, um, and, and the numbers just don't bear that out. Mm -hmm. So uh, we were talking earlier about the changes in policy. Mm -hmm. um, 
Is that really the main way to address this, or are there other things that uh, need to be looked at? Um, well, I, I think the policy changes create the biggest bang for the buck. Um, I think you know, if we look at what, what we did after the Depression to, to change the, that dynamic, um, we had very pro-union legislation. We had the GI Bill. I mean, we sent, we sent more people to college, right? Because education does mediate um, mm -hmm. a bit. Not as much as you might think, right. but it does mediate. So we did a lot of things. Um, and then we backed away from it. We started to deregulate things. We started to deunionize. And whether or not those are politically viable now, I, I, <laughs> I'm thinking not. Right. Um, but other, in other words, any policy, raise the minimum wage. Put more hands, more money in the hands of people who will spend it, as we were mm -hmm. talking earlier. Um, and I, and I really don't think, um, if I speak honestly, that we can expect anything to happen in Washington or Jefferson City. But I do think that there are local things that could, that could feasibly be undertaken. Yeah. So on the local mm -hmm. things and, and sort of some of the ideas that you guys had, um, did you, you, you said, you know, go out and talk to people. I mean, are, are there some things maybe that you learned in this process of trying to figure out um, what a newsroom can do that surprised you about the issue or um, surprised your, your classmates about it? Yeah, I think um, when we were looking at the issue at the beginning, we were really thinking about the extremes on the spectrum. And what we learned after doing more research and talking to more people is it's really the people in the middle that are getting lost. And it's the middle class that is struggling in a way that we like haven't seen recently or maybe didn't even realize was happening because a lot of these people are still employed and are able to you know, maybe send their kids off to school and things like that, but aren't really doing as well as people think they are or as we as like society think they are. So we talked a lot about how to find the right people and even just going to community forums was a great option too. And then when we talked to people, that was really just when we learned the most about what people in the community care about. They care about, a lot of them care about their kids and the education system and making sure that they're able to help out their neighbors. So we just wanted to make it really community focused because then you get to help out your neighbor and really see your community grow a lot. So that was like the thing we saw people care about the most was helping community Columbia grow together. Yeah, well, it must have been interesting to kind of have that realization that you don't have to go special places to find these people. You just have yeah. to kind of walk down the street and talk to almost anybody, yeah. right? Yeah, that was really cool. That was something cool for me because I had no idea that, you know, maybe just talking to people at the grocery store, the person checking you out, bagging your groceries, somebody standing at you in line, you know, have a conversation with them instead of staring at the magazines or the gum rack. <laughs> yeah, right, right. <laughs> Well, and I think Amanda brought up education being an issue. Are, are there uh, particular issues that you think would be good entree points, Candy, in terms of trying to get people to, to understand the issue or to maybe, you know, change some things a little bit? Um, yeah, and I, and I will circle right back to your point about the people in the middle. Um, we, we tend to think about this as extremes. Um, and what, what we see happen with the, with the inequality is that um, people get stuck at the end. In other words, you have, if, you, um, if you are born into a poor household, you have a 40% chance of being there as an adult, and the same is true at the other end. So we do lose that, that whole middle class that is really what, what makes us vital as a society. Um, and I think that any way we can encourage that, because I think, I think helping that group see what's happening, right? Because those are the folks who still believe that if they just work a little harder, they can achieve that American dream. But what the numbers will show you is that most of them cannot. Mm -hmm. they, we, we are losing our ability to move between classes the way that we used to. So um, I think that, that working with that group and helping them understand that, you know, it's not you. This is not, it's not it's something wrong with you that you can't get ahead or can't get a raise. It's other things bigger than that. Well, and I think that quote I read at the beginning about the American dream is not true anymore was kind of harsh. But um, 
Well, Amanda, I'll put you on the spot <laughs> since you're All about right. to graduate and yes. <laughs> pursue the American dream. And you did a lot of research on this subject. So what are your feelings about kind of the American dream being alive or altered or not at all something that's there anymore? I think that a lot of people in my generation are really struggling with what, if they think that's even true or not, that there is an American dream because we've like, you know, we saw the recession happen and we're graduating now at the time where jobs are not as easy to get. So I think I myself am still hopeful that it's out there and I maybe naively still think that if I work hard enough and I dedicate my time and I really push that I can get there and be able to accomplish everything I want to. But maybe in 10 years, who knows what I'll be thinking. <laughs> oh, <wow. laughs> hopefully, hopefully I'll still be as positive as I am now about it. Yeah, well, I, I hope so. <laughs> I hope so. Because I, I haven't given up in the American dream. But, um, but I, don't, I don't know, Candy, what do you think about the idea about, do we, ha do we have to reshape the American dream into something else? Or? Um, yes and no. Okay. I mean, I, I, think, I think that the American dream is a great story that we told, and, mm -hmm. and we all learned it in school, and it's part of what made us great. But I do think that we have to realize that it is not very functional right now for most of our citizens. Um, and as long as we cut that group out, we can't make it work. So it, it's a big group. Mm -hmm. So it's a big group, and, and they need to be healthy and vital and optimistic, <laughs> right, um, and feeling like they can make some progress. I happen to be a, a, a horrible optimist. So, yes, I think, <laughs> I think we can reclaim it and we can, um, we can fix it. So, um, but, but we have to take action and do that. Um, we can't just sit and wait for it to correct itself. I, I don't think it will correct itself. Well, that's kind of what we've been doing, I think. And, right. You know, the, they uh, talked about it at Davos. Uh, President Obama addressed it um, not that long ago, uh, talking about maybe raising taxes. Mm -hmm. You mentioned the, raising the minimum wage. Um, but there's, you know, people that w would disagree with that, uh, you know, and say, well, you can't, if you start doing those things, you're going to, uh, hurt the economy. You're gonna, you're gonna, you know, spoil things. And I guess you would say, there's, you know, how low do we go? But um, what do you think about some of the arguments for just saying this is kind of the the way it is? I think I think that there is always going to be some inequality in any economy. That's just the way it goes. Um, and I think there is likely to be more in the American economy just because of who we are. Um, but I think to believe that we can have a robust economy which provides opportunity for people in the absence of a thriving middle class is very short-sighted. Yeah. Well, but on the other <laughs> hand, we, we seem to have done it for a long time, right? Yeah. I mean, you know, it's getting worse, but it's been... It's been bad for decades, right? You, you said you wrote something about it in 1995, 1995. and nobody paid any attention <laughs> to it. Well, yeah, and it, it, but again, I think you know, it, it's one of those where in, in some cases I think we have to, um, yeah, how low can you go? It, things have to get worse before they get better. Um, so I'm hopeful that we're about as far as we can go. <laughs> and that, um, see, I'm optimistic um, that we will, you know, even, even if that action occurs at a local level, I mean, even if cities take some of this, I mean, some cities have passed living wage you know, policy right. in, their, in their community. So um, I think that being able to model that is, is one step that's feasible. Yeah, well, that's, that's true. I wonder if, because this is a, a, a global issue, a national issue, you need policies, you need a lot of action. Um, I wonder, Amanda, if you felt like in your research that um, there are things that can happen locally or whether or not it's um, too big of a challenge. I think starting locally is a really 
great place to start. Like you mentioned earlier, raising the living wage and the minimum mm -hmm. wage, I think is a good place to start. And also just encouraging people to keep things local, you know, hire locally, buy local, because if more people are able to buy local, then the store owners will be able to hire on more people, which is hopefully just gonna create a great cycle of people spending more, creating more business. And Columbia has been growing recently, which I think is great for the economy. We've been seeing a lot of growth, especially in downtown area. So I think by just keeping it going and encouraging people to hire locally, spend locally, and really like just look in their own backyards, hopefully this can be a model for maybe other towns hoping to do the same. So do you think, so, so you're graduating soon, do you yes. think that this would be, um, what do you think it would be like if you went out there and had a job that was devoted to this? I think it'd be really interesting. I wouldn't really know where to start because there's, you know, <laughs> nonprofit side, there's the, politi pol the political side, which I'm not as familiar with specifically. But I don't know, I think it'd be really interesting to dedicate like a year to just do a full project, spend a year with a family and just really see what their life is like. Yeah. and hopefully shed some light on an issue. And, and, and chronicle it, write about it, and yeah. show videos, all the stuff you guys learn at the J school. <laughs> yeah, put my J school education to use, right? and basically it's, just like embed myself in a family. I think that'd be really cool. I yeah. think it'd be a really interesting thing to do. Well, and it seems like that's, um, the, you know, the idea about people that are struggling with this are everywhere, mm. and, <clears throat> but, but their stories are not told because I think the stories go from the extremes. Mm -hmm. You know, figuring out a way to tell everyday stories and, and make people aware of how, what's really going on out there, it, it could be kind of eye-opening, right? Definitely, we talked about how, you know, for every one, and if you're looking at a high school graduating class, for example, you know, maybe there is the one or two kids that get scholarships and get to go off to their dream college and really improve their situation, but what about the other 100 kids in the graduating class that didn't get that opportunity? You know, looking at not just the kids who like made it big, but just kind of what everyone else is trying to do to just get by. Right. Yeah, right. We don't talk about that enough. And well, Candy, what about your students? Do you have, what, what, what's your experience talking to them and getting their reactions? And well, I have students who are in social work, so um, they're, they're, not, they're not looking to be in the top 1% usually. <laughs> and, and unfortunately for us, you know, the, the, the irony is that you're talking about a bunch of students who really want to help people and whose dream would be to work themselves out of a job, and yet they all know that for social workers right now, you're going to get a job because there's so much work to be done, right? right? Um, we have elderly, you know, increasingly large elderly population that are, that are going to be part of this slipping down to the bottom, um, as well as lots of mental health issues, violence, all of the things that come with the kind of unraveling that economic inequality hmm. creates. So the jo their job prospects are pretty good. So their salary <laughs> prospects not so right. much, right. but they will have a job. Here's the good news <laughs> and here's the bad news. Right. But, yeah. Well, yeah well, that's something we didn't talk about is the kind of the demographics of inequality. Uh, I assume that it's, you know, it's it's just the the demographics of the population. But is that true? Are there is there? Oh a, no, no. It's disproportionate um, racial by race and education. Um, by race and education, okay. but, yeah, but not age. But, yeah, well, I haven't really looked at that piece. Okay. So. But we have a, a, you know, we have that baby boom bubble that's going to come into that. So I would expect, you know, that that group of folks is going to strain the public systems that are there. So, so and make may some skew older ripples. kind of, yeah. right, that kind yeah, of thing? maybe. Yeah. Well, I guess we'll see. But I, I think it's, it's interesting to think about social work profession and how that's, you know, going to be a boom profession. Yeah, it's, yeah, we hate that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, really, in our hearts, we hate it. But, um. Yeah. Well, uh, so what, uh, is there anything else that we didn't talk about that you think we should really let folks know about uh, income inequality? I, th I think we covered a lot. I think we covered lot. it pretty well. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think it's, you know, it's a fascinating subject, and I think the idea of um, 
trying to figure out what to do in, a, in Washington where there's, it's dysfunctional and very difficult to get anything through you know, Congress uh, is really going to be the big challenge. I, I was looking, I wrote it down on my piece of paper, but the, the tax rates, because that's what President Obama talked about, mm -hmm. is that we should raise the taxes on the, the wealthiest, mm -hmm. that one hundredth mm -hmm. of a percent that make $23 million a year. Um, but, you know, if you look at the tax rate since 1929, or I don't know when, uh, but they've steadily gone down. Right. You know, and uh, they were, uh, Ronald Reagan uh, lowered the tax rate, to, but to 47% on the wealthiest Americans, mm -hmm. and now we're at uh, 32%. Right. That's a big difference. So you, you, it's, it's kind of like, well, maybe we have some room to do some things here. If only we can get people to do them. Right. And, and you can see in the, you know, if you look at the charting of, of how it goes, um, that, that there was a big jump in that upper 1% in 2000 and 2001 when we did, in fact, pass a bunch of tax cuts that favored the wealthiest 10%. And so... That's, that's where you get a big jump toward that bar that looks just like 23 to 29. <laughs> right. Well, and that's wow. how you see how policies yeah. can affect things, because right. if you lower the taxes, look at the, look at the graph. So anyway. Right. All right. Well, anyway, thank you very much, thank Amanda. You. Thank you very much, Candy. <laughs> We're out of time for this month's uh, edition. And thank you very much for joining us, and we'll see you next month.